As all good teachers know, repetition is an important part of the learning process, right? Many times that's the way the Lord deals with us. When he tries to teach us something, sometimes we don't get it the first time, do we? We don't get it the second time. Sometimes we don't get it the third time. And so he allows similar challenges to come into our life so that we can learn and we can grow and we can become more like his son. Our scripture reading this morning is a passage of scripture that we have already looked at. We looked at it back at Clover Hill when we anointed the building. We set it apart. We dedicated it. We prayed that the Lord would be there, that he would be pleased to dwell in that place. We prayed that it would become a Bethel, a house of God. We did the same thing when we came to Woolridge. We anointed the outside of the building, and this morning, we did the same thing here in the sanctuary, in the Sunday school. It may require some thought, some prayer, and some time before we understand what the Lord has been trying to teach us today, but He is teaching us something. I'm certain of this, though, that unless we continually hunger and thirst for Him, unless we hunger and thirst for His presence, We have nothing. Unless we have Him, we have nothing. And you say, well, of course I know that. But maybe He's just trying to remind us of that. A scripture reading this morning is from Genesis. Genesis chapter 28. It's the story of Jacob. He's on the run. He has deceived his father Isaac and he has stolen the blessing from his older brother Esau and his older brother is out to kill him. So Jacob takes off. He leaves his home in Beersheba and begins a 450 mile journey up to Haran. But about 50 miles into the journey he stops along the way and he stops for the night. He plans to sleep out under the stars takes a stone and he uses it for a pillow and he lies down and he falls asleep and he has a dream. He dreams that he sees a stairway, a stairway beginning on earth and ascending all the way up to heaven and he sees angels ascending and descending on this stairway and then he sees God himself standing there and the Lord speaks to Jacob And he promises him that he will be with him, that he will protect him, that he will bless him. And not only will he bless him, he will bless his descendants. He will give him the land to the north, the south, the east, and the west. Jacob wakes up and it says he was afraid. He didn't know that the Lord was in that place. He had just stopped for the night to sleep. And so he took some oil. And he poured it on the rock that he had used for a pillow. And he said, the Lord is in this place. I will call this name, the name of this place, Bethel, the house of God. And maybe that is the lesson that the Lord wants us to remember and learn this morning. That we are to always be in awe of the God that we serve. This is the house of God. The Lord is here with us this morning. Genesis chapter 28, beginning at verse 11, it says, And he came to a certain place and spent the night there, because the sun had set, and he took one of the stones of the place and put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he had a dream. And behold, a ladder was set on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, 
The Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac and the land on which you lie. I will give it to you and to your descendants. Your descendants shall also be like the dust of the earth and you shall spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south and in you. And in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised to you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on its top. And he called the name of the place Bethel. Lord God, you have reminded us Again, that this is your house and that you dwell in your house. And Lord, we must never forget and never take for granted your presence. You have reminded us once again that we need to approach you in awe. You are our Lord and our God and you work in ways beyond our understanding. We've seen it, and you've reminded us of it again. I pray, Lord God, that as you move among us this morning, you will speak to us individually. That we will arrive at the place, as Jacob did, where we are in awe of you, and we can say, the Lord is in this place. Help us never to forget that. And we thank you, Lord, for your presence. And pray you would minister to us, speak to us as you spoke to Jacob. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. We were asked to describe what Jesus looks like. How would we answer? For many of us, our thoughts would go to a picture that an artist or a sculptor had created a picture from the imagination of that artist. A picture of an infant lying on a bed of straw or of a man full of compassion and love for those around him. Or maybe a picture of suffering, a picture of the agony that our Lord endured when he died for us. The Apostle John had the privilege of seeing Christ as he really is today. The vision of Christ that John had in Revelation chapter 1 overwhelmed him. He saw Christ clothed in a robe reaching to his feet. Across his chest was a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like snow, like wool. His eyes were burning like a flame of fire. His feet were glowing like bronze that had been heated in a furnace. His voice roared like the waves of the sea. His mouth, from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was shining like the blinding light of the sun. And John was terrified. It said he was paralyzed with fear. He fell down at the Lord's feet and the Lord put his right hand on John and he said, Do not be afraid. Stop being afraid. He said instead, Write. He told John to write down three things. Revelation 1.19 He told him to write down, first of all, The things that you've seen. What had John seen? He had just seen the vision of Christ. He said then, 
write down the things which are, the things which are taking place, the situation that Christ addressed as he addressed the seven churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 and the situation that exists in the church throughout history and today. But after chapter 3, it's interesting. The word church, ecclesia, isn't mentioned. It's not mentioned until all the way at the end of the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 22, verse 16. So the question is, where is the church for the majority of this book? John is about to find out. Then Christ tells John to write down a third thing. He says, write down the things which shall take place after these things. After what things? After the things that have just taken place. After the things that are. After the church age. After the church is gone. Future events. In verse 1 of Revelation chapter 4, John begins to speak and to tell us about these events. The chapter begins after these things. The scene shifts from earth to heaven. But where's the church? John 14, verses 2 and 3. Jesus told his disciples, I go to prepare a place for you. He says, and if I go, I will come again and I will receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. That is what has happened between Revelation chapter 3 and chapter 4. Somewhere in the margin. The church has been taken. 1 Corinthians 15, it says it will happen in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, we shall be caught up in the clouds, it says in 1 Thessalonians 4, to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall ever be with the Lord. We are about to get a glimpse of heaven, our eternal home, the place where Christ has taken us to. We're about to get a glimpse of Christ, our Savior, as He is. A vision of all that is to come. We don't have to wonder what heaven will be like. We don't have to uh, rely on the imagination of an artist. We're about to find out. Verse 1, John says, I looked. Oreo. He says, I saw something. Amazing. Behold, he says, this was an incredible sight. Verse 1, a door, a thura. He says there was an entrance. There was a gateway. And he says in verse 1, it was standing open in heaven. A door into the presence of God had been opened. And then John says, I heard a voice. He said, I heard a voice like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me. The same voice that John had heard in Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. It's the same voice. It's the voice of Christ. Remember, he said his voice was loud and it was powerful. It had the clarity. It had the authority like the sound of a trumpet. John says, I heard the same voice. And the voice said to me, verse 1, come up here. Arise, ascend. Ascend to this place. We are fascinated with the future, aren't we? We watch all kinds of TV shows. We read all kinds of books. We want to hear the stories of the experiences of people, all kinds of people, who claim to have been to heaven. We want to try to figure out what the future is going to be like. What's going to take place? What's going to take place in our future? You know, the future is more than just predictions. It's more than just an educated guess. It's more than just someone's experience. It is a plan. What did Christ just say? These events must take place. The focus is not so much on the events that will take place. That's everybody's focus, right? They want to hear about the events. 
Christ said, that's not the focus. The focus is the fact I am the one who is in control of these events. They must take place because I am the one who has planned them from eternity past. No one can change the plan of God. No one can stop what is about to happen. We're about to walk through a door with John. We're about to walk into the future. We're about to see how this plan will unfold before us, how it must unfold. We're about to take a road trip to heaven. Immediately, verse 2, John says, I was in the Spirit. I was wrapped in the power of the Holy Spirit. He says, behold, verse 2, pay attention to this. He says, here's what I saw. A throne, a thronos, a bench, a chair. John, is that what you saw? You saw a chair? It's a little more than that. It's a picture of the authority of God, of his authority over creation, his authority over us, his authority over the universe, his authority over everything. Psalm 103 verse 19 says, The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over all. Isaiah 66 says, The Lord says, The heavens are my throne and the earth is my footstool. He rules. He reigns. We're stepping into the throne room of God. We're stepping into the presence of the Holy One. The One who rules with absolute power over the events that are about to be revealed to us. This throne, John says, was standing in heaven. Kimai. He says it was permanent. It was unshakable plan of God is unstoppable. Can't be hindered. No enemy can stop it. No enemy can stop him. Why? He says, verse 2, because he is the one sitting on the throne. Kathemai. He is reigning on his throne. He's in control. Revelation 19.6 says, Hallelujah. For the Lord God, the Almighty, reigns. He reigns where? Reigns in our hearts. He reigns in our lives. But He doesn't reign on earth, does He? Someday, He says, I will take back my creation. And I will rule and I will reign on earth as I do in heaven. You know, people laugh at that, don't they? People laugh when you talk like that. They want to try to explain away the Bible. Oh, they do that all the time. They choose to ignore God. They choose to ignore Him and His Word. It has nothing to do with them. But someday, we are told He will sit in judgment. He will sit on His throne. And Hebrews 10, 31 says, It is a terrifying thing. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. John attempts to describe him. Poor John. What a job. Verse 3, he says, The one, he who was sitting, he said was like a stone. God is like a stone, he said. Solid? Enduring? Okay, we get it, John. He said, no, he's like a jasper stone. Revelation 21, verse 10 and 11 describes the new Jerusalem, the heavenly city, as having the glory of God, and the brilliance of that city is compared to a stone. It's compared to a precious stone. It is compared to a stone of crystal clear jasper. John says, yes, that's what he was like. He said, the one who is sitting on the, on the throne gave the appearance of a diamond with all of its facets flashing, radiating light. First Timothy 6.16 
What does it say of God? He dwells in unapproachable light. So John sees the glory of God radiating from the throne. It's almost blinding. He describes him that way. He says, but it wasn't only that. He said, not only was his appearance blinding, radiating this light. He says in verse 3, his appearance was also like a sardius, a carnelian, a fiery blood red stone like a ruby. It's a reminder, isn't it? That he has purchased us with his blood. Acts 20, 28 says he has purchased us with his own blood. His blood is the sacrifice. So though God dwells in unapproachable light, we approach the throne by the blood of Christ. It is a throne of grace. What a picture of God. And John says, no, wait, I'm not done yet. And he says, pay attention, verse 3. He says, there was a rainbow around the throne. A rainbow, John. Yes, a symbol of God's faithfulness. Faithfulness to his word, a promise of his mercy, a promise of his grace, a sign given to Noah. Remember, Noah and his family had just left the ark. God had destroyed life on earth because of the wickedness of their sin and their disobedience. And so God put the rainbow in the sky as a covenant, as an agreement, as a promise that he would not destroy the inhabitants of the earth again through a flood. His word still stands. His word still stands in heaven. That's what he's telling us. The rainbow reminds us that he is faithful and true to his word. But this rainbow, it's not like any other rainbow we've seen. John says this rainbow is unique. He says it was like an emerald in appearance. It was green. He said it sparkled like an emerald. Ah, God's word. It's precious, like an emerald, like a gemstone. His word has value. But this rainbow is green. That's a promise for us, the earth, for the inhabitants of the earth. God's promise is true. He, when he offers mercy and grace to us, we can count on it. He offers it to all of us who will come to him, all of us who will trust him. He's ever faithful to his word. John says, yes, that's what I saw. Now then John, in verse 4, points out what's around the throne. It says he looks and around the throne there were 24 thrones. Why 24? In the Bible, the number 24 is the number of representation. First Chronicles 24, it talks about 24 officers of the temple. And they represented 24 groups of officers for service in the temple. First Chronicles 25, it talks about 24 groups of singers. And each group was assigned a time to minister in the temple. They represented the larger group of singers. So here, in Revelation chapter 4, verse 4, there are 24 thrones. They represent a larger group. But whom do they represent? Who are they? John says, I saw the thrones. He says, and upon the thrones, verse 4, were 24 elders sitting. Presbyteros. Men. People. Leaders in the church. But they represent a larger group. Who do they represent, do you think? They represent the church. They represent us. It's a picture of us. We are in heaven. 1 Corinthians 6 says we will judge angels. 
We will judge the earth. We will judge the world. Revelation 20 says we will sit on thrones. Revelation 2 says we will rule the nations. Revelation 5 says we will reign. Revelation 3 says we will sit down with Christ on His throne. And 2 Timothy 2 says we will reign with Christ. We who know Christ are there in heaven. That is us. Verse 4, and it says we are clothed in white garments. We've heard that before, haven't we? Clothed. In fine linen, it says in Revelation 19, clothed in linen, bright and clean, clothed in the righteousness of Christ. We are there, clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And it says in verse 4, we are wearing crowns. Stephanos, a wreath. First Peter 5 says we will receive an unfading crown of glory. First Peter 5 says... Uh, 2 Timothy 4 says we will receive a crown of righteousness. Revelation 2 says we'll receive a crown of life, a crown of eternal life. We are there. That is us. We are there around the throne in glory, in the presence of our Savior, and we are there forever. We are looking at our future. That's us. 1 Thessalonians 4.18 says comfort one another. With these words. What a comfort to know, to have this information. That is where we will be. Who else has that kind of assurance except us who know Christ? No one. No one knows what's going to happen to them. They don't know. Why do you think they watch TV? Why do you think they read the books? Why do you think they care about the experiences of other people? Because they don't know, they don't understand. We know. We understand. It's a comfort. But John says, don't get too comfortable. Things are about to get a little uncomfortable. Because John's attention is drawn back to the throne. He says in verse 5, he says, From the throne proceed, ekporomai, spread out like a storm. Flashes of lightning. A strape. It's a dazzling display of blinding light. He says, and sounds, phone, voices, rumblings, cries. He says, verse 5, and peals of thunder, brante, explosions. It's a little frightening, isn't it? It's a preview. God is giving us a preview of what's to come. Revelation 8, when an angel takes fire from the altar and throws it to the earth, it says there followed peals of thunder and sounds and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. In Revelation 11, when the temple of God is opened, it says there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. In Revelation 16, as judgment is poured out upon the earth, yes, there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And it says a great earthquake that had never before occurred on earth since man had come to be on the earth. These flashes of lightning, these sounds, these peals of thunder are a preview, a warning of what is about to be poured out on the earth. A warning of the wrath to come. A warning what must take place. God continues to warn us. It's there. It's in the book. He tells us what is about to happen. And John looks and he sees and he says, in front of the throne, he says there were seven lamps, seven lamps of fire, and they were burning before the throne. He says, which are the seven spirits of God, the Holy Spirit. Once again, the Holy Spirit is represented as seven burning lamps. We, we've met up with this picture, haven't we? Revelation chapter 1, Isaiah 11, Zechariah 4. It's the sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit. But here, 
It's a little different. It says there are lamps of fire burning. Lampas. Torches. These are burning, blazing torches. The same kind of torches we find in Judges chapter 7 that Gideon used when he went into battle. The same way that Nahum, in Nahum chapter 2, verses 3 through 4, described warriors in their chariots, he says their appearance was like torches. These are torches of battle. They're torches of war. They're torches of judgment. John 16, 8, it says that the Holy Spirit is the one who convicts the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. He shows us the reality of our sin. He shows us that our sin is rebellion against God. And how each one of us responds to that conviction will determine where we will spend eternity. And as John stands before the throne of God, the world is in rebellion against the Lord and His Christ, and the world has rejected the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. And so the picture is of judgment that is about to fall upon the people of the world. They have rejected Christ. They have rejected God. They have rejected the work of the Holy Spirit. Like I said, things are getting a little uncomfortable. And it says in verse 6, before the throne, the same place where these seven lamps of fire are, John says there was something said that brought me a little relief. He said it was, uh, there was an appearance. He said it was a sea. He said, it, well, it was like a sea. It, it was like a sea of glass, like crystal. It looked like water, he said, but it really wasn't water. It looked a little more like glass. In John's time, glass was dark in color. Clear glass, crystal, was very expensive, and it was very rare. But John says that's what it looked like. He said, it looked like a sparkling sea of glass that stretched out between me and the throne of God. He said, it was pure. It was smooth. It was unchangeable. But the wicked? What does Isaiah say in Isaiah 57? He says, the wicked, no, not so. He said, they're like the tossing of the sea. It cannot be quiet. They churn up refuse. They churn up mud. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. Not so in heaven. There is peace. There is purity. There is surety. There is the unchanging presence of God. That is where we're going. That's our home. What a comfort for us who know Christ to know that is what heaven will be like. And then we are introduced to four figures. These four figures, we're going to run into these, these guys as we go through Revelation. They're going to be a part of the events that unfold. And John says in verse 6, in the center and around the throne, near the throne, he says, I saw four living creatures. Not animals, not creatures like that. He said, four tessera zoa, zoa, life. He said, four living ones, four ones who have life, angelic beings. Similar to the cherubim found in Ezekiel. Similar to the seraphim found in Isaiah. Ezekiel chapter 1 describes them. He says their appearance. So they had four faces. He said their feet were like calves' feet. They glowed like bronze burning in a furnace. He said they had wings. He said, under their wings, on their four sides, were hands like human hands. Their wings, their wings touched each other. Their faces didn't turn. He said, all four of them had the face of a man. They all had the face of a lion. They all had the face of a bull. They all had the face of an eagle. 
Ezekiel 10, he identifies them. He said they were cherubim. Remember when Adam and Eve were dri driven from the Garden of Eden? They were driven because of their sin, because of their disobedience. And Genesis 3.24, it says God placed cherubim to guard the entrance, the way to the tree of life. And they had flaming swords. These are a specific group of angels, powerful angels, guardians of the holiness of God. Ezekiel 28 tells us that before Satan rebelled against God, he was one of those powerful angels. And God shows John that these are the angels. They give the appearance of these angels found in the Old Testament. These four who are around the throne. He says they were full of eyes in front and behind. John is struggling. John's struggling to give us an idea of what he's seeing. He says they're full of eyes because they're always seeing. They're always alert. They're always diligent. He says they're always ready to carry out their assignment as guardians of the holiness of God. Then he gives us a description of each creature, each living one. He says in verse 7, the first one, the first living one was like a lion. Picture of strength, majesty, king of the beast. Isn't that what we call the lion? Like Christ. The Lion of the tribe of Judah, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. He says in the second creature, verse 7, the second living one was like a calf. It's a picture of service. It's a picture of sacrifice. Like Christ, who came as the perfect servant, as the perfect sacrifice. He says in the third living one had the face of a man, man created in the image of God, like Christ who came to earth as a man, perfect, sinless, yet still God. And he said the fourth one, he said was like a flying eagle soaring above the heavens with speed, with agility, like Christ who descended to earth and has ascended back up into heaven. These living ones reflect something of the one whom they serve. That might be a lesson for us. That somehow we might reflect something of the one whom we serve. And John says in verse 8, Each of them, each of these living ones, they didn't have four wings like the cherubim. He said, no. He says, I counted the wings. He said, they had six wings. Six wings. They're like the seraphim. In Isaiah chapter 6, why do they need six wings? Go to Isaiah 6, 2. It says, with two of them, he covered his face. Even these angels won't look on the glory of God. It says, with two of them, he covered his feet because they stand in the holy presence of God. They stand on holy ground. And he says, with two, he flew in service to God. Yes, he says, these creatures, these living ones around the throne, he says, were full of eyes. He says it again in verse 8. Because they serve him. He says, they serve him day and night. They never sleep. They never rest. And they never cease to say, verse 8, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God the Almighty who was and who is and who is to come over and over again they say holy 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 is the Lord God Almighty they say you alone God are holy you are our master you rule over all you are the eternal one before time you exist in time, you exist. And when time is no more, you continue to exist. You are forever. 1 Samuel 6.20 says, Who is able to stand before the Lord, this holy God? Who? 1 
verse 9, it says, When these living ones give glory, doxa, praise, recognition, and honor, time, value and worth, thanks, eucharista, gratitude, thanksgiving, to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, when they do that, we'll be there. We will hear them say that. We'll be a witness to everything that John has just seen. And when we hear these living ones say that, get ready, here's what happens. It says, the 24 elders, verse 10, the true church, those who us, of us who belong to Christ, we won't be able to stand. We're sitting. It says, verse 10, but we fall down before the throne. And it says, verse 10, we worship him. That word is packed with meaning. Proskuneo. It means we fall down and lie flat on the floor before God at his feet and we kiss his feet. The one, it says, who lives forever and ever. And it says, then we place, we cast, we place our crowns, it says, at his feet. Place them before the throne. All that we have, all that we are, all that we have been given, we give to Christ. Why? Because verse 11 says, Worthy art thou, our Lord and our God. You alone are worthy. You are alone are worthy to receive these crowns, it says, to receive glory and honor. We value you above all else. You are worthy, it says in verse 11 to receive power. But wait. We changed the words, didn't we? Look back at verse 9. The angel said, give thanks. We say power. Well, I'm glad we know this ahead of time. Why did we change the words? Power. Dunamis in Greek. It means strength. It means might. Ah, it means miraculous power. Well, the angels have seen God's power, haven't they? They can testify to it. Our God is in the heavens, the psalmist said. He does whatever he pleases. The angels know that. But they haven't seen his power like we've seen his power. Who better than us who have been saved know from experience the miraculous power of God, the power of Christ to reach into our hearts and to rescue us from the domain of Satan and to transfer us into the kingdom of his son. Angels don't know that. Only we know that because that has happened in our lives. And so in verse 11, we say, for thou didst create all things and because of thy will they existed and were created by your will, Lord God. You have created the heavens. You have created us. And you have created us to worship you. You are our Lord. You are our Savior. You are our King. There is none like you. There is no one like the Lord our God. And we are in awe of you. And so we fall down at your feet. And we worship you, and we give you glory now and forever. Amen and amen. Lord God, you have given us a picture of our eternal home. We will be forever with you. Thank you, Lord God, that we don't have to wonder. We don't have to fear. We know where we're going. Thank you, Lord God, that we will worship you forever and ever. But Lord, as we are comforted by these words, we, we realize how many people don't know you and don't care to know you. 
I pray that like those living ones, our lives would somehow give evidence of who you are. And that while we are here, while we have this time, while we have the opportunity, we might be in awe of you and we might live for you. Thank you, Lord, for the picture that you have given us of your throne. The picture of light, of the glorious light of your presence. And though, Lord, you dwell in unapproachable light, you have said you invite us into your presence through the blood of Christ. And as we celebrate this morning the gift of eternal life, we remember our Savior as he has asked us to remember him with the bread, with the cup. To remember that he gave his body for us as a sacrifice, that he poured out his blood to buy us back, to bring us into your kingdom so that we can be there with you forever. Lord God, help us to remember where we're going and help us to remember the one who has given his life for us. I ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.